Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Savant Report podcast. Today, we're going to continue on our real estate topics. I've got a really special guest, uh, TXMC, who is at TXMC Trades on Twitter, uh, is a guy that I've been following for several months. And I have to tell you, his data is on point. Uh, he's rather new to kind of the macro uh, scene. He's a, a Bitcoiner at heart. And uh, I've had him on my channel before. He gave a tremendous amount of content and information, very relevant stuff. He's really good at charts and data analytics. So today we're going to talk to him specifically about real estate and housing and kind of the, the indicators that he's looking at, some of the charts that he's found, some real good hardcore data. TXMC, thank you for coming on again, man. It's really great to have you. Thanks for having me back, Jordan. I'm excited to talk to you, man. Well, I can tell you I am more excited than you are because I have been salivating to get you back on the channel for, I don't know, maybe a month, month and a half. Um, we had such a great conversation last time we talked. I mean, we really, uh, you and I just seemed to click and we seemed to get a, a lot of data out there for some people really interested in the macro. Um, and I'm looking forward to hopefully having equally as good of a conversation today. Um, you know, I just, I want to give you props and I want to tell all the, the, the listeners and, and watchers, uh, if you don't follow at TXMC trades on Twitter, if you're not on Twitter and you're a YouTube person, please check out his YouTube channel. It's called alpha beta soup. Uh, I'm going to put a link below. Uh, seriously, this guy does amazing work. Like his mind just works in this incredible way where he, he takes data and he overlays it with other data to try and extrapolate important things to try and forecast the future and uh, and see where we are today. So you'll get a taste of that today. I'm really excited about that. So TX, um, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in the housing market, kind of your you know 30,000 foot view of what's happening right now. Sure, sure. And I really appreciate all the kind words. Thank you so much. Um, They're well-deserved, by the way. I wouldn't say them if they weren't absolutely true. Thanks, brother. Uh, you know, for the, for the housing market, you're you're right. I'm 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 newish to the scene, uh, particularly with housing, and I've just been become really intrigued by the rate of change of a lot of metrics over the last six months, nine months, not just in housing, but really like across the economy. That's caught my eye because you know, uh, in economics, in, in markets in general, absolute values don't always matter as much as rate of change, and the quickness that the market has gotten overheated and now subsequently what appears to be the quickness that it is slowing down uh, is both historical and also kind of wild to look at. Uh, so I guess I can start here. Let me see if I can share my screen with you and I'll show you a couple of my charts. Uh, I'm going to sh just share my Tableau directly. So that's not the screen, I apologize. Let me just share my desktop. Here we go. Okay, so you can see my desktop, right? Yep, we got it. Excellent. Okay, so this is the 30-year mortgage rate uh, for the United States, 30-year fixed rate average mortgage. Um, as of my last data, it's 5.8. I actually think it has come down slightly. I think it's at like 5.4 or something, but regardless, the, the thing that really caught my eye down here at the bottom, this is year over year change in the mortgage rate, just basis points. And it's the swiftest year over year change in the mortgage rates since 40 years ago. Uh, so just right off the bat, 30,000 foot view, uh, that is in large part what has caused what we can look at, you know, what, what we'll look at through some other charts in a very swift slowdown in the housing market and it's pricing people out. Wow. That is, that is, uh, you know what, I've showed a, a similar chart on, uh, on my channel just last week. And I, I gotta tell you, I, I, I fear that in this tightening cycle with further to go, I mean, we could see this rate of change. I mean, maybe we see a little blip down by, you know, 40, 50 basis points, right? But but it seems possible and plausible that these rates continue to go up. It does seem possible. I mean, uh, you know, when I look at bond yields broadly, they do appear like they've kind of tried to top out near cycle highs. Uh, 
but the Fed is still tightening. It does appear we've got a bit further to go on this journey. So uh, I can't rule anything out as being not possible. So it certainly seems uh, like it's in the realm of possibility. And, um, you know, it, it's more than just the rates. I, I think it's also the valuations combined with the rapidity of the rise in rates that are combining to have a, a massive headwind to slow down this market that's gotten really overheated. Um, and I, you know, I think we looked at this chart when I was talking to you last time and we were talking about the wealth effect. And you know, th- what we're looking at here in blue is the median household income for the United States. And the black line is the year over year change in the home price in dollars. And you can see that my data goes back about 40 years. It goes back to 1983. And we just had home prices rise in a year over year sense in more dollars than the median household income. And to me, that says two things. One, it really demonstrates the scale of the growth in the housing market, just kind of how unrealistic it has been over the last year. Uh, But also I think it creates a juicy target when the Federal Reserve is trying to figure out where they can target their tightening to avoid utter economic calamity while also doing what they feel they need to do in cooling demand. We could get into that if you wanted to, but, Basically, my takeaway from looking at this is that there are a lot of homeowners that saw exorbitant leaps in their house prices, in the values of their homes. And in one sense, that creates a feeling of wealth, a feeling of financial comfort. Mm -hmm. But if you think about people coming into the market, when you see this kind of a change, in addition to this kind of a change in mortgage rates, uh, it, it really, it really serves to price out would-be buyers, you know. And one thing I think about is, if that's the case, what does that do to the rental market? You know, if it pushes people out of home purchases and into renting, uh, what's going to happen over there? You know, is it just going to go out? Of, is it just going to go crazy? You know, um, it's a really interesting thought. I, I think about the rental market uh, as it relates to inflation, and you know, typically in real estate. Um, we want to see as much rent growth as a landlord, you want to see as much rent growth as you possibly can. Um, and historically, that's been anywhere, you know, between three and 5%. And that's kind of the, the landlord's target. Well, over the course of the last, you know, couple of years, we've seen seen rent growth, especially in some of the bigger metropolitan markets, um, as, as well as some of the, you know, smaller markets like North Idaho and Coeur d'Alene, like where I am. Uh, double digits. I mean, we've seen rent increase by uh, 10, 20, 25% annually. And, and that's massive. I mean, that's just like for the average person's budget. And a lot of the conversation that's happening in markets like here in North Idaho, and and listen, I know I talk a lot about North Idaho. I love this place. I'm super passionate about it. It's Um, beautiful. If you've ever seen photos of it, there's a reason people love it up there. It's, you know, the photo I have behind me is like just a sliver of a taste of, of what, uh, what North Idaho is all about. It, It is absolutely gorgeous. Um, but you know, the, the conversations that's happening in markets like we are here today is, um, simply that people who have grown up here and lived here are never going to be able to afford to buy a home here. Um, and that renters like your average person who makes 15 to 20 bucks an hour can't afford to even rent an apartment here. Like the average apartment rent is like over 1500 bucks, right? And, um, and sometimes for like a nicer two bedroom apartment, you might be pushing 2000 bucks for North Idaho, right? For this, for this little community of like, you know, 50,000 people in this area, it's a big deal. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I hear that. And, and at the same time, I've, I've watched rents increase in, in, a, in apartments on a national level, uh, double digits in, in a lot of markets. In fact, I would go as far as to say most markets. And you wonder when that trend reverses. So if we see people not buying and we see more renters, in theory, it should drive up demand for rentals and perhaps, you know, rent increases. But what happens when people can't afford those rent increases, even Mm -hmm. with the higher demand and lower supply? So we have this like this juxtaposition of situations here that's 
to me is really concerning. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, how does this resolve? What are your yeah, thoughts? It's, I don't know that it resolves in very many ways other than some kind of demand destruction. I don't really know what that looks like in housing, though. You know, if I, I haven't gone down that rabbit hole yet of really seeing like how, how much can you really stall demand for housing? You know, like that's it's one of the hierarchy of needs. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's something people must have. And so uh, I, I don't really know what that does. But because of when you think about the priorities of people's expenses, you know, housing is probably near the top of the list. So I, I imagine that it, it, there becomes a necessity to make that purchase. And all that does is hurt their ability to spend in other parts of the economy. So in, in a sense, you know, what's happening to housing, if it can't cool off enough, uh, if, if prices remain kind of sticky and elevated, particularly if energy costs and materials costs and things like that stay elevated, uh, then that's just going to be a vacuum for capital out of other parts of the economy because j- just to just to maintain the market, you know? So I, I want to talk to you about that note for a minute um, and and what what could cause destruction, a demand destruction, excuse me, in in housing. I want to talk about apartments in specific or, or the rental market because um, I, I think it's pretty obvious that with higher interest rates, at the end of the day, the, the, the buying market is going to slow down, right? But from a, a housing cost perspective, um, I was on Ben Cowan's channel, Into the Cryptoverse, uh, the other day, and I brought up some charts from Redfin, to, you know, that kind of show where um, housing affordability and, and prices to own have now gone way higher than the price to rent, right? And, um, and that's a recent trend, like in the last six months, you've seen that line go vertical, in terms of cost to own. Um, but he, here's my thought. As a real estate investor, I sit here and think about delinquency rates. And so I wonder, you know, is, is the economy potentially going to get bad enough where delinquency rates go from 2 or 3% on average, like in an apartment complex, to 8 or 9%. And so if they go to 8 or 9%, and then you're having all this, you know, this, this turnover because people are getting evicted and, and that kind of stuff happens. Where do those people go? That's a whole nother question. But um, I think that would be the first place that we see it uh, is in defaults and in uh, just generalized, um, you know, unaffordability, people not being able to afford where they're living. Um, and that's going to kind of, that really bad thing because it forces people down the metrics in terms of uh, quality of housing, right? They they might go from a class A project to a class C project, and that's not good for society. Um, You know, we've talked a little bit about the fourth turning on on my channel and, you know, kind of how things develop and how, you know, really frustrated segments of society begin to rise up. Well, if someone can't afford a $1,500 or $2,000 apartment payment uh, and they're forced into a class C project, um, you know, dilapidated apartments that aren't taken care of and, and whatnot. What, what does that do to the angst in society in the midst of an economic uh, collapse, a recession, and potentially a depression? That, uh, that's a big question. Uh, you know, I, I recently, I've read The Fourth Turning not that long ago. I was really familiar with their work, uh, but I, I read it recently and I was really just kind of stunned at how uh, accurately it has portrayed the last 20 years. Um, yeah, that's a really good question, Jordan. And you know, you mentioned uh, delinquency rates. I've been, I'm waiting. Uh, I think next month we'll get an update to uh, the household debt and credit report that the New York Fed puts out, and we'll get to see some updated numbers. But I can show you a couple of things. I will show you here um, a couple of values that are from the most recent report. And so, what we're looking at here are mortgage transition rates between current status and 90 days late status, current being in green, 90 days late in red. So at the top are the actual rates uh, over time, going back to the beginning of the millennia. And uh, you know you can see mortgages that are of current status, uh, they're still high, like historically high, but it is beginning to soften. And we're starting to see mortgages that are transitioning into late status has been rising here. So at the bottom, I put it in year over year terms. And you can see year over year, mortgages that have current status are down almost 6%. And 
Mortgages that are 90 days or more late are up 5% year over year. And if you go back in time, the last time that was the case was the great financial crisis. Now, this is obviously a low value. When you look at where it is, the actual rate is down here at 13%. Back in the great financial crisis, it was well over 25, 30%, as much as 50% of mortgages almost uh, were, were late. But so we're, we're still at a low relative historical value, but the rate of change is a little bit alarming. And I'm hoping we don't see a big jump higher in this value uh, when the quarter two numbers come out. You know, I want to I want to touch on that for a minute. There's two things I want to I want to share with you. One is a, a quick anecdotal story. Um, this last weekend, my wife and I were out hiking, ran into some friends. Um, uh, the, the wife is a real estate agent, and she was talking about delinquency. And she said, "Listen, in this local area, historically, we'd see about ten notice of defaults, uh, which is the beginning of a foreclosure action, per week." She said, "The week prior, it was up at 50." Right. Wow. That's that's a five X increase in the average foreclosure or notice of default, you know, phase um, week over week. I mean, that's that's like a pretty big jump. And people are, are bringing up the narratives. Well, is this about the covid relief stopping and, you know, all of that kind of stuff? I, I'll be honest, I haven't heard of that many people that have actually gotten, you know, forbearances on their mortgages and all that kind of stuff. I think that's kind of gone. Um, I'd be curious to know if you have any data on that, but I want to talk about that number in, um, Q2 of 2008 to Q9 or excuse me, Q2 of 2009. And you said almost 50% of mortgages were delinquent. I want to talk about the reason why a lot of those, like that's a very inflated number. A lot of those were strategic defaults. Those were people who were underwater on their mortgage and we're told by everyone that you could do one of two things, right? You could, you could strategically default, even if you could afford the mortgage. And if you were in default, they would refinance you at a lower interest rate and provide you some relief in your payments. Or two, if you wanted to sell your house and, and you were underwater, you couldn't do a short sale unless you were delinquent. Right. So the the structure, the the uh, I don't want to say regulatory structure, the environment at that point in time was such that if you were a good paying customer and you were taking care of your credit, if you needed to move locales and move across the country and needed to sell your house, you couldn't do it if you were underwater unless you were in default. And so that really like spiked. Uh, the default ratio probably much more than what like the actual true distressed homeowners um, would have showed in the, in the data. So if we look today at 13.1% um, in, in default, my concern is that the real number back then might have even been half of that. That means we're halfway to the 2008, 2009 era default ratios. And that's not in the news yet. Like that, right. it, it has not hit mainstream, hey, mortgage defaults are up, foreclosure actions are on the rise. Um, so, I, you, you know, I'm kind of eyeballing the data and I'm mm -hmm. eyeballing the chart in terms of where I think it was. But I, I really do believe that in that era, 2008 to 2009, even 2010, a big portion of those defaults, maybe as much as half, were strategic. Wow. That's really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, that that's that definitely colors this analysis a little bit. And uh, you know, I, I I but it's really interesting if you look at the, the the rate of change of delinquencies. You know, even going into the Great Financial Crisis, this line here in the middle is zero, right? It's basically flat. Mm -hmm. You know, and then all of a sudden it just takes off. Well, we've been basically flat negative, but essentially flat for a decade. And now all of a sudden it's taking off. I mean, it doesn't mean we're going to live this exact same thing over again, but it definitely, I mean, there's a noticeable change in the rate of change here. And then when you, when I hear that anecdotal story you shared, uh, that that's a bit alarming to be sure. Um, and, you know, go ahead, sorry. No, no, no. I, I was just going to say, like, if you put yourself in a mortgage lender's uh, shoes, and you say to yourself, well, somebody's coming to me and they want to short sale their property, but they've been on time making their mortgage payments. Like, why would I do that? You have good credit, you have a job, you have income, you're current. And so 
we won't consider a short sale um, and letting you out from underneath this debt unless you're in default. Otherwise, why would we, right? So it it makes sense on one hand, but it incentivizes people to to default. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of those mortgages were written, you know, back in the day, uh, TX, there was a huge amount of mortgages. And I, I don't know the exact percentage, I'm going to say probably 30, 40% that were written as first mortgages and second mortgages with combined loan to values of greater than 95%, right? 100% loan to value loans and 80% first and a 20% second were totally common back in the day back in 2004, 2005, 2006, going into 2007. And so um, a, a lot of these people way over leveraged at very high interest rates. And a lot of them were emotionally tied to the home. And they said, like, listen, I don't want to sell my house, but I can't afford um, the mortgage right now, in, you know, given the financial circumstances in the economy. And they were current on their payments, but they were trying to refinance to lower rates, but rates weren't that much lower. The only way you could get a forbearance agreement with the bank or get the bank to rewrite your loan at an interest rate that was affordable that you could actually maintain was to default. That's the only way they would consider it. Wow. So uh, because they were writing loans at below market interest rates in order to keep that portion of their portfolios performing. So like, there's a whole bunch of nuances here. Like it, wow. you, you know, it's just funny. It's like with the PPP loans in 2020, like the government was giving out massive PPP loans to people who didn't need it. And it was a, totally legit. I, I mean, it was just the program that they designed and everyone was taking advantage of it. I know someone that's gotten over a half a million dollars of PPP loans forgiven uh, and they didn't need it. Like they didn't need it to survive. It was just what was given to them by the government. And so um, you, you know, this is kind of a similar situation where people are incentivized to just work the system. That's incredible. Uh, and there's a, there's a chart here that I was really looking forward to showing you, um, because I, I'm, I, I'd be interested to hear your opinions on it. So this is a look at mortgage originations by credit score. So the highest end credit scores, 760 plus are the gray bars at the top. And what you can see, I, I love this chart. It can show, it shows you so much of the housing history. So like these dark bars at the bottom, these are the subprime candidates. You can really see the subprime boom here in the middle 2000s. You can see it dying off. And then over here, basically since the beginning of 2020, the amount of mortgage originations from high credit score applicants has exploded. If I show it to you in line form, you can really see how much bigger it is than the rest of the market. This is in billions of dollars. Now, obviously, People with high end, high credit scores, they probably have a higher propensity to buy higher valued homes. Uh, so the disparity here is slightly explanatory, but I, I think it's really um, kind of amazing to see how much of the recent housing activity was driven by people at the top of the credit brackets. You know, listen, I, brother, you are so on point with looking at this. Um, and, and this is really fascinating to look at it in, in this color-coded way. Um, I have to tell you, like people ask me often, is this 2008 again? Are we going to see another crash in real estate prices? And um, I, I had a conversation with the famous Bitcoiner, Greg Foss, on my YouTube channel a few weeks ago. Foss is great. Oh, Foss is, he, he's such an amazing guy. He's brilliant. He's smart. And he cusses like a sailor, but he's so genuine. I just love that guy. Um, and uh, amazing Bitcoiner. And I think just an amazing guy altogether. Very brilliant mind. But, um, you know, I asked him the question because he is a credit guy. I said, like, do you foresee a 2008 type of situation again? And he said, no, and here's why. He said, we don't have the same leverage in the system that we had before in 2008. Like in Vegas, uh, which was my home market for 20 years, um, you had cab drivers that owned eight homes and all they were doing was just flipping homes, right? And they would get stated income mortgages saying that their tips were huge and they would just write a number on the loan application that made the numbers work. And... Um, borrowing 95 and 100 percent of the value of these homes and they were just flipping them and that was rampant in 2005 2006 2007 and you know it was kind of like a game of musical chairs when uh 2008 hit whoever 
was still left standing, you know, just got rug pulled. And, um, and so, so the difference between 2008 and now is one, the amount of leverage and, and, um, and debt in the marketplace from people who really should not have had it. Back in the day, 80-20 mortgages, I remember loan programs that would allow you with a 580 credit score to get 100% loan to value at a higher interest rate with a first and a second mortgage. And like people were writing them like crazy if you had a 580 credit score. So the difference today, and one of the reasons why I think this bear market in real estate is likely to be different if, if in fact we enter into a bear market, which I foresee happening, is the, the leverage isn't there and the credit scores and the quality of, of buyers and borrowers is so different than what it was back then. And, and mm -hmm. I mean, that's like really well articulated in this graph going back into the 2004 to 2007 timeframe. Like I've never seen high quality borrowers to this degree. The other thing that's interesting, and this is a boots on the ground metric, and I, I wonder, TX, if maybe on the next podcast we do, I don't know if you could find this. I'd love to know how many people are paying cash. Because I know in this market, like people were, were coming up here from California, they'd sell a 900 square foot shack for $2 million. And they were getting, you know, a 3000 square foot house on 10 acres that was beautiful for $2 million. And um, there was this huge inflow of cash buyers that did just write a check for it. And that's not accounted for in a lot of this publicly available data that I've seen. So I'd, I'd be really curious if you could find that. I would like to look for that. And I'll make, I made a note here while you were talking about it. Uh, so the next time we chat, I'll, I'll pull, try to pull that up. Um, but yeah, that, you know, hearing your, your color commentary there really adds a lot for me, because when I looked at this, the, the first thing I noticed was, wow, it really does seem like the quality of, of, of debtors is quite different from what it was back then. I mean, you can just see all these lower bars took up much more volume than they do now. Yeah. Uh, so the, clearly there is a shift in the acceptability of, you know, lending for all the, for these banks that are writing these mortgages. Uh, and uh, it, it really, it, it feels like it ha the catalyst, if it is a, if it is a bear market, the catalyst has to be something slightly different. It can't, it's not going to be exactly like it was in the middle 2000s you know, maybe just for one of these reasons being one of the strongest that we don't have all of these, like you said, 580 credit scores uh, and things with mortgages. I and mean, you can see just that the market share that they have is considerably smaller than it was back then. You know, if I could add one more to your list, that would be mm -hmm. amazing to look at. It would be overlaying loan to value on top of this chart. Okay. That would yeah, I'll check, I'll check that out. That would be amazing because that tells you how much these people are going to leverage. You know, higher credit score borrowers. Um, uh, like, like, look, I don't want to pass judgment on anybody with a low credit score. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why people have low credit scores, and it's not just pure irresponsibility. Um, but that's how the the world and the credit markets view it, right? Right. So, uh, I, one thing I will say, and and this is fact, this isn't, you know, trying to diminish anybody um, who might have a low credit score is that the propensity or, or the commonality of people with high credit scores willing to ruin that credit, unless in absolute dire straits, is very small. Like people who have 700 credit scores, 800 credit scores, typically um, will fight to keep their credit in good standing. And, um, and people with low credit scores, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, just kind of look at it, well, like, hey, there's, there's another one on my credit, right? Like, it is what it is. And they, they don't take it as serious. And so I do think that a stark contrast between 07, 08, 09, is that even in a dire economic set of circumstances, I do think that a lot of these borrowers are going to fight to keep their mortgages current. And it's going to be those that really, truly can't afford it, or it's going to be those who just accept default much easier and much quicker in the lower credit score ranges uh, that are going to end up defaulting. That, that's just my guess. And, and that would lead me to believe that there's not going to be a massive cascading of defaults, but a more orderly unwind. 
you know, mm. over time. So it, it may not be nearly as deep as, as like the 2008 market was. I see. Yeah. And you're, you're right. Like people with a high credit score, they'll defend it because it, the having a, having a, a, a pristine credit score is an asset unto itself. You know, it, it allows you cheaper financing. It allows you more financial flexibility uh, and, it, and it can actually save you money. So I, I really think that people, that there's a lot to that, that people will defend having that on their, um, you know, having that on their profile, so to speak, uh, having a good credit score. You know, this is a topic for maybe a different discussion, but I will say that the credit score system is is pretty messed up, right? How how the credit agencies, the credit bureaus, um, actually create and and uh, maintain credit scores is really asinine. Like I remember a couple of years ago, uh, I had an eight hundred credit score. Uh, over 800 credit score and like no issues at all, but I had a bunch of open credit cards that I never used. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to close a bunch of these because I, I don't need them anymore. I have like a credit card with a $500 credit limit on it. Like, why am I even keeping that? Right. And so I closed like three or four accounts and my credit score dropped a hundred points <laughs> like in one month. Because you're, you don't have uh, unutilized credit limits or whatever. Like they consider that a good thing. You just having all this useless credit limit sitting around. Isn't that insane? Um, just absolutely insane. So TX, um, given the macro backdrop, you know, what do you think is the likely path forward? What, what are the things that you're looking at that are saying economically, like I'm really concerned. Um, you know, you and I have have talked offline quite a bit about some of the stuff that's been happening uh, in, in the you know economy. We had negative GDP uh, Q1. We're waiting with bated breath for GDP report for Q2. Um, a lot of the really brilliant smart minds are saying we're not in a recession yet, but we're probably going to be sometime in 2023. Um, th then you listen to the average person who follows macro on a day-to-day -day basis, just as a, as a hobby guys like you and I, and we're like, what are you talking about? We're already in recession. We're, we're, we're already there. Um, there's all these different narratives out there as to where we are. And the S and P's drawn down by 20, 25%, NASDAQ's down 30, Bitcoin's down 75. Um, you, you know, all the risk on assets are just getting clobbered. Like, where do you see the macro exclusive of real estate, but just, just a general economy. Well, I do think, I think that we are in a recession, but the tricky thing is that a technical recession, two quarters of negative GDP growth is not what the U S government considers a recession. You know, when you look at the NBER, they consider all these different inputs and, um, they all they also tend to be quite lagging on their identification of recessions. You know, we they might not even acknowledge that we're in one for another six months or a year, and then go, oh yeah, middle of 2022, that was a recession. Uh, and when you when you look at the things that they count, it, it's there's a strong likelihood that they may see this allegedly tight labor market uh, as a sign that we're not in a recession. Right, because usually you don't mm -hmm. see job growth at the same time that you see the economy falling into the ground. There's something to that, uh, but uh, I, I also see a lot of weakness in labor demographics, which I've been tweeting a lot about in the last couple of months. Uh, th there's, a, there's a lot of fundamental changes to the US labor force over the last 20 years that make the, the potential of maximum employment look a little different, in my opinion, than what people like at the Fed are looking at. What I'm concerned about, I think, uh, is that these lagging indicators, like looking at unemployment, which can remain uh, very tight until you're literally at the dawn of recession, by them looking at those kinds of things, they're probably likely to tighten us into an actual recession, despite it being what they claim we're going to avoid. Uh, that my, my that's been my base case for the last few months. I think there's still a lot of disbelief out there, uh, particularly as it relates to corporate earnings you know, for the next for the rest of this year. In a lot of ways, they've remained relatively static for most of this year, which is kind of mind blowing. Uh, and I, I see that as 
people, companies are holding on to hope, right? They're holding on to optimism that they'll still be able to see positive, not positive growth. And uh, the things that I notice that I, that I think are big disconnects is, is the difference between nominal and real growth. You know, like you can see nominal growth in GDP. You can see consumer spending is still holding up, even if it's not growing as the, at the pace it was last year. But when you adjust those things for inflation, which itself is a flawed and likely underestimated metric, things like real wages are negative. Things like consumer spending on a real basis are negative, and they have been for a few months. And it's really showing that people are continuing to spend money, but they're buying fewer goods with it. And the goods that they're buying are of the non-discretionary types, kind of like what we talked about earlier in the call, like as the things people are required to buy remain elevated and continue to get more expensive, all that does is suck liquidity and volume away from other parts of the economy and harm growth. So I, I, I believe we're, we're probably in a recession right now. I think that we've seen multiple compression you know, and, and the market was reacting to rising rates, but we haven't yet seen the other shoe drop, which is typically earnings. Uh, I posted something the other day, a tweet just a couple of days ago uh, about the, the relationship between inflationary periods and the change in corporate earnings. And it's, it's really, if you look back at the last times we've had inflationary spikes, um, which was back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, all of those periods saw lower and weakened corporate earnings. And we haven't yet seen that. Uh, earnings and inflation are both still kind of pointing up. So we haven't seen the shoe drop, but it has happened every time. So uh, I, that's kind of what I'm looking for. And if we actually get some something akin to an earnings recession, that is likely to lead to job cuts. Uh, and then you know, then the economy is really in, in a shitty handbasket at that point. You know, that's, that's what concerns me. Um, you and I talked about this uh, last time you were on the show. What concerns me is that the, the Fed is looking at uh, two metrics that it has to deal with. The first one is uh, simply inflation, right, which is more than four times uh, what their mandate is, which I think they're going to have to change their mandate sooner or later. There's no way we're going to be at 2% inflation going forward. I agree. Um, and then uh, the, the other mandate being full employment. And so they don't care about the markets. They don't care about the S&P. They don't care about you, you know uh, the bond market or, or any of that stuff so to, to any big degree. They care about inflation. That's their mandate. And the, the biggest hammer that they have in their toolbox to smash inflation is interest rates. And with tight unemployment at three and a half percent, 3.6%, they can keep smashing. Like they can literally keep smashing. Um, I think we went from what, like 3.5 to maybe 3.6% unemployment, like this tiny little, you know, de minimis tick that really doesn't mean much in the grand scheme of things. What happens if they keep doing 75 BIPs, 50 BIPs, 100 BIPs, and we go into 2023 with sub 4% or thereabouts uh, unemployment. And then all of a sudden we go from 4% to five and then 5% to six, right? That's when they pivot, but that could be 12 months away. Mm -hmm. I, it could be. I, that, that worries me. It worries me as well. And, um, you know, I think that they're, I think that they're going to eventually run into the cold reality of math on these rate hikes um, simply because of the cost of the debt or right? the cost to maintain it is exorbitant and it's continuing to rise. And on a month over month basis, it's extremely high. Uh, just in May alone, we paid $50 billion just on interest expense. Uh, and last year, the US government paid $380, $390 billion just on interest payments on the debt, just to keep it in good standing. Um, I mean, social security is 600 billion, defense is 700 billion. We're paying more than half of that a year just to keep the debt from defaulting. And so that value is continuing to rise. It continues to rise because the debt is not really coming down, right? But now we're raising rates. So th there's, 
there are some serious mathematical headwinds on their ability to raise to their final target. And you know, when you think about a debt of $30 trillion, uh, granted, there are a lot of different interest rates in that government debt. There are a bunch of different maturities and they're rolling things at different times. Uh, but as rates rise, all of the rates in the debt slowly rise on a lag as they roll things over and they catch those new rates. Well, the interest rate on all the debt for the government right now is about 1.7%. If they raise the federal funds rate up to their 3.5%, 3.8% target, and they keep it there for a while, and it starts to pull up the rates across the maturities that they're holding, then we're looking at $700, $900 billion a year, maybe a trillion dollars a year, just in interest expense alone. And when you think about how we're running 10, 12% deficits to GDP, uh, when you think about the fact that consumer spending is what powers GDP, and as assets fall and the economy weakens, consumer spending comes down, that pulls away from tax receipts. So where does the government get the money to keep the debt in good standing? At some point, their hiking plans are simply foiled by basic finance. And so I, I think that that is a reality they will meet at some point over the next few quarters. Maybe I, I would put it at two or three quarters from now. I don't think they can keep this pace up. You know, 75 basis points every, every meeting uh, almost seems unrealistic to me. I think that they're probably going to have to start cooling that down. Obviously, I mean, I think July is pretty much a lock for 75. I wouldn't be surprised if September is only 50. And then after that, maybe the next one's 25. Uh, I think that the, what they say is in an attempt to get the market to give them room to operate, but they have absolutely no conviction. And in no way are they beholden to sticking with the things they say they're going to do. They almost never do. So uh, I think that we're just a few months away from finding out just how committed they actually are. So, uh, so that's interesting. But let me ask you what, what or when and how the Ponzi ends, right? Because, um, you know, like I saw, I think it was Brad Mills um, about a month ago posted a, a pyramid of our debt maturities. And in the next two to three years, I think we have something like nine trillion that has to be refinanced in the next two or three years, like 9 trillion out of our 30 mm -hmm. trillion. Um, and if, if we have to be paying double the interest rate on that 9 trillion, um, and that does end up with us having to spend a trillion dollars a year in interest payments thereabouts in our total debt load, which by the way, just continues to skyrocket. At what point does a government just say, hey, the only way out, the one and only way out is to inflate our way out of this? Mm -hmm. And um, and I just kind of wonder, you know, when is that tipping point? Because it's been talked about for decades. It hasn't really come. Uh, an interesting chart I, I, I put on a video the other day uh, titled, uh, you know, can we really kill inflation or something along those lines? Can we really stop inflation, I think? Um, we spent the first 215 years of our country's existence creating the first seven trillion in debt, mm -hmm. and we've created seven and trillion in debt in the last two years. Two, two years, seven trillion in debt. And so, at what point does this break? At what point do we just say, "Hey, we have to inflate our way out of it," or do we become Japan that economically stagnates for decades? And we're just, we're the sole buyer. We're just printing money to buy back our own debt. That is unfortunately what happens uh, throughout human history. You know, um, if you go, you can go back over a thousand years, civilizations have been going through these cycles where they believe that they can have unbacked paper money that is held, that is controlled by the government. And eventually, economic growth is not able to be maintained. And so the, the only real choices a government has, or a sovereign, I should say at that point, because they weren't all governments in the past, some of them were monarchies. Uh, the only real pass they have at that point is allow the currency to uh, be rejected by the people or simply to continue inflating it away and trying to give people more liquidity to pay off their debts. And that eventually just leads to hyperinflation. Um, 
but but the thing is about those those cycles i mean we've been going through them like i said for over a thousand years but they take decades to play out you know um and what i think plays in the favor of the us if i could use that word um is that there's so much dollar denominated debt around the world that keeps a certain floor on the demand for dollars right it's hard it's hard for people to just reject it as a currency when they have a lot of obligations that require that unit to be paid in. So that is part of the reason why the U.S. has been able to push their deficits and their debt levels so far as a percentage of GDP. And when you look at other nations just in the last century that have reached the levels that the U.S. is at, where we have 130% debt to GDP, where we have 10% or greater deficits to GDP, countries in that position have defaulted within two years, all of them, with the exception of Japan. Wow. And the, we are in that position now. We have 125% debt to GDP. It was just at 130 last year. And we have 10% deficits to GDP. We're there. Uh, if you look at our G7, G20 compadres, many of them are very close to us. You know, Many of them are at the 100% debt to GDP, 110%. Many of them have 5%, 10% deficits. So they're slowly creeping that way and we're leading the pack. And the only nations ahead of us are places like Japan and Greece and Italy, which are not good examples. So I think that the US is in a very tough position. Unfortunately, we have created a system that is wholly reliant on liquidity at this point because it is all based on debt and debt must continually expand or it dies, right? And there is a constant because the, the Fed is constantly issuing more dollars and those dollars all carry an interest rate, there's like a perpetual short squeeze on the dollar. And I think that that's part of the reason why it hasn't just gone into the ground, but it also creates a never ending demand for more of those dollars. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a really complicated situation to try to even describe in a few sentences, you know, but historically, the path out of this is more like what happens to Weimar Germany than something else. Uh, but I don't know that that's going to be our path. I, I don't think it will play out that easily because of the dominance of the dollar and the dominance of dollar-denominated debt everywhere. It and could what, take much more, much more time. What happened in Weimar? Well, in, in Weimar Germany, uh, I don't know all of the history, so I'm probably not the best person to tell the whole story. Uh, but... You know, that that is the most pristine case of hyperinflation in modern human history. Have you ever seen the chart of uh, the Weimar marks in gold and the way that it hyperinflates basically into into a vertical line? And that happens as people reject the currency, right? As people are trying to exit the currency, and that that's what I'm. That's that's the counterforce of the demand for dollars to pay debts that I was talking about that is kind of preventing that from occurring. You know, and I think as long as we're in this kind of dance where we have a lot of demand for dollars, but we also must continually inflate the supply of dollars to support that demand, I think that we are in for this bubble continuing to rise and pull back and rise and pull back. And if we switch to a QE environment, while inflation is still relatively elevated here, uh, I, I think that it could be much more volatile and choppy than the last time we had QE, uh, because back then inflation was only 2%, 1.5%. Well, now it's 6%, 8%, 10%, depending on where you look. Uh, so I I don't know if I've given you a great answer on your question, but it, it it's there's so many different ways to take this you, when you try to think about the path out and none of them are very attractive. Right. Yeah. It was interesting. Uh, Greg Foss described uh, the, you know, kind of the breaking of the financial systems um, you know, like 2008 was a, was a breaking event. Right. And um, he said, listen, every time like the, the end gets closer Every time we have a breaking, every time something systemically breaks in the credit system, um, then we weaken everything. And eventually we're going to get to a point where uh, the end game is that we will continue to weaken over time. Every one, of, every one of these breaks that happens brings us closer to the inevitable end. 
So um, here's here's my question for you that relates back to Bitcoin, which is I know is a, a passion of both yours and mine. But is Bitcoin the solution? Do you view it that way? Um, and and how do you pin Bitcoin against gold? I've been thinking about this a lot lately, uh, and. Uh... It's interesting. You know, there are a lot of people that believe that Bitcoin is um, is going to become adopted by sovereigns. And I, I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if that's true. I think that sovereigns have an incentive to protect their own currency. For sure. Um, I, I think that the ultimate path out of this entire saga that we're in is the collapse of so of other sovereign currencies in and ba back into the dollar and the dollarization of other nations. And eventually the dollar may be the last fiat standing. Uh, kind of the dollar milkshake theory for that. But as far as Bitcoin goes, you know, I, I think that we may begin to see more small nations of the El Salvador type uh, trying to adopt it, trying to take it into their balance sheet as some kind of a reserve. Uh, but uh, I don't know that it's positioned yet or, or that we're in, in, in any place where it's realistic for me to try to project a place where Bitcoin gets adopted broadly by other sovereigns. Uh, because like I said, I don't think that they're incentivized to do so. They have zero control over it. And that fact alone is a deterrent for most sovereigns that thrive on control. So I, I think that it's, it's, it sets itself up to be a very grassroots adopted monetary system, which is great. I mean, that that's the way I think it should be. I think it should be more uh, at the behest of individuals to decide this is something I need to be exposed to because the currency that my country is giving to me is not allowing me to protect my wealth, right? And so I, I think that it becomes kind of a, an independent monetary, I mean, it is an independent monetary system, but I think that's more of its fate than being something that is used by sovereigns. Uh, that's my general feeling right now. And that's why I think it's so important that individuals find a way to expose themselves to it and, and have a plan to adopt Bitcoin at some point into their finances if they haven't already. Uh, because I don't really see a path for any of these other fiat currencies other, other than the very doomy one we've been describing. Uh, but I, I, for all those for those same reasons, as all of these nations are scrambling to try to defend their own currencies, I think things like Bitcoin will be seen as uh, as a villain of sorts, and in its in its anti fragility has only begun to really be tested in that regard. That's that's really interesting. Um, I agree with you completely. By the way, that like uh, sovereign adoption is is probably a long ways out, um, and uh, you know if it happens and to what degree it happens. But I I um, I also agree that you know it, it, it at least the the way I'm presently looking at it. Um, you know, I think the Bitcoin price potentially has a long ways to go down before we bottom. Uh, it's certainly a possibility. I'm not saying it has to or it will, uh, right. but, it, but it certainly could. Um, but I also view Bitcoin as almost like a must have in an investor's portfolio as an insurance policy, um, because it really is the last free stand that any, uh, you know, world citizen has to a, a store of value and a quote currency, if you want to call it that, uh, that is not controlled by a government where, right. you know, you can't uh, pull levers and flip switches and knobs and, you know, all that kind of stuff to, to make things happen to the currency as it relates to other currency. Like Bitcoin just, it, it, it circumvents all of that. And uh, Greg Foss calls it... Eh, I keep mentioning Greg. I don't mean to do that, but he's such a brilliant guy. In in my conversation, he dropped me like you know two dozen truth bombs that just resonated with me. But he views it as an insurance policy, and and I asked him the question. I'm like, well, is it an insurance policy or is it an investment? Like, which one is it, Greg? Because if it's a insurance policy, people don't put 40, 50 percent of their net worth in insurance policies. Right. And he said, you know what, Jordan, um, I want to clarify because in the credit business, insurance is a big part of our portfolio. And that's how you protect. And that's actually how you derive returns is from those insurance policies. And he explained it really well on that podcast. Um, 
And as I sit here and I think about Bitcoin and the macro set of circumstances, like my, my plan is to buy as much freaking real estate as I can when I think that the bottom's in. Um, you know, I want to develop multifamily and, and ultimately want to be uh, way, way deeper into real estate than what I am. I've been taking it really easy for the past, you know, year, year and a half because of uh, the, 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 the price points. And, mm -hmm. and I, I knew that we were at a cyclical high. And so I'm super ri uh, risk averse, but uh, real estate's a place I want to be in the future. I see a ton of opportunity there, but Bitcoin, I think is still and remains one of the biggest asymmetric opportunities as an insurance policy and an investment. I mean, do you agree with that or disagree with that as you look at this 10,000 foot, you know, view? Oh, I 100% agree. I think it's the most asymmetric bet that you can make. Uh, and, you know, but, but getting involved in Bitcoin means you have to understand its volatility and its high beta to risk assets, regardless of what its anti-debasement design is intended to do. And buying into Bitcoin for the long term is an acceptance that it will ultimately reach its potential, but it still has a ways to go. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, when you go through these period, these downturns, you have to be ready for that. You know, you have to be willing to, if, if you need to offload some of your Bitcoin to make ends meet, some people need to do that. You know, you make your own decisions. But I think because of its inelasticity to demand, because they're not going to make more of it just because people want to buy it, because it's completely decentralized, it's not controlled by anyone, and all of its issuance is planned in perpetuity into the future, I think that it's probably the most asymmetric bet you can make. That's why I find it valuable to be invested in. I have a considerable amount of my own net worth in it. Uh, but I also am not consumed with timing the bottom perfectly, right? I, I understand that it goes through these cycles and every year, like clockwork, it has a 50% correction, mm -hmm. you know, at every bear market, it has an 80% plus drawdown. Uh, so I, I, you know, once you understand that and you kind of separate yourself from the romantic narratives that get swarmed around on, on Twitter, uh, it makes a lot of sense, and and the, these these kinds of downturns are not so hard to weather when you when you know how it's going to perform. But as as one of the maybe last remaining free markets in the world, it's it's an extremely effective fire alarm for the global economy. You know, it tends to come down when things are starting to deteriorate before equities do. It it, sends, it gets the message sooner, but it also tends to bottom before other markets. It has in the past. It moves with markets, but oftentimes it finds its low before the S&P does, before the NASDAQ does. It's and so the canary I, in the coal mine. It is. And I think it's because it's not very, it's not a very regulated space. It's an international borderless space and it runs 24 hours a day. So it gets a chance to react to things as soon as it smells blood in the water. And I think that that makes it extremely effective. And, you know, it's up to everyone to decide how much to allocate to it. Uh, but me personally, I'm trying to acquire in this bear market as much of it as I possibly can. And when I see it down 70% from its all-time high, Maybe it goes down another 30%, another 50%. I have no idea, uh, but this is the place for me to begin scaling into a position. That's kind of how I've personally been looking at it. Obviously not advice for other people, but uh, that's kind of where my mind state is on it right now. And, but also I'm not really watching Bitcoin to tell me when macro will get better because I think the situation is so complicated now that it's more than just looking to see if Bitcoin bottomed, you know, like maybe you could in 2018 or in 2020. I think at this stage that the situation is far more complex. There's too many moving parts uh, that Bitcoin might not be the first thing to tell us when the economy is getting better, but I do think it'll be the one of the first assets to respond when there's a clear softening of conditions. Very interesting. Um, and I agree, by the way, for whatever that's worth. Um, you know, you you tweeted something really interesting the other day, and, and I think I've got about 15 more minutes of your time, and buddy, I hate to tell you, but I'm going to try and take every bit of it. Um, okay. So you, you tweeted the other day, and I'm reading this. It says, everyone is bearish, so I must be bullish, in quotes, is an overly simplistic axiom that loses validity in a correlation one market. 
there's a time and place for it. And then you tweeted a tweet you had previously written back in, uh, in May. In an expansion, a bottom is formed when the last seller is exhausted. That is the mythical capitulation wick. In a contraction, a bottom is formed. Uh, oh, don't tell me I didn't get the whole tweet. Okay, I'm going to let you finish it because my, my computer won't let me see the whole tweet. In a contraction, a bottom is formed when the problems causing the downturn are abated. And most people are looking for number one while ignoring number two. I believe that's what I said. That is, that is what you said. So, so tell us where you see us uh, right now. We're certainly not in an expansion. Right. And, and we're in a contraction. So how, how close are we to... Uh, the underlying circumstances changing? Do you think we're 12 months, 18 months from a macro perspective? Well, that, that I know is that's really asking, difficult. That's asking for a guess, an educated guess. Sure. I understand that, you know, that's really tough to forecast, but you're very on point with so many things. I, I think I would be relegate to, to our viewers if I didn't ask the question, how do you view it? Yeah, it's, it is very complicated. And when it comes back to what we were talking about earlier, where how, how far can the central banks push this before they hit the cold reality of math and they are forced to create money to pay their obligations because there is simply not enough of it coming in. I think that that reality is within a calendar year of now. Uh, I don't think that they can continue to tighten this economy for another year at the same in the same way that they have without either coming face to face with the expense of maintaining their debt obligations or by absolutely cratering some aspect of the economy be it the labor markets because of an earnings recession or possibly you know the treasury market going utterly no bid like it did in 2020 something like that uh, is probably going to happen before they ever reach their actual end targets and you, there was a chart posted by the Incrementum Group. They put out that In Gold We Trust report, which is one of the best reports you can find out there on the internet for uh, economic research. Amazing free report, beautiful charts. And in there, they showed a visualization of Fed tightening plans over the years overlaid on top of the federal balance sheet. And you can see how their optimism has rarely been met by reality. So let me share that with you real quick. So we have a frame of reference. Awesome. This is the chart. So the blue line is the Fed balance sheet. These colored lines are their projected tightening paths. And you can see they have never once been able to meet them. And so <laughs> when you look at the current path and you think about all of the previous instances of QE since it began, uh, I really don't feel like they're going to get there. And so the <laughs> no real way. question... Real, real quick. This is a this is a fantastic chart, <laughs> and people it, wonder it, why the Fed doesn't have credibility, right? Right. So my where I come back to it is where on this line here does this stop coming down? Just like it did back here in 2019, just like it did in 2013, 2014. That is going to happen again. And when I think about the sheer volume of interest expense sitting on their like their balance that they have to pay for, uh, they're running headlong into this. So the question is, how far do they get before we have a blowout in unemployment? Um, because that seems to be the thing that is most likely to break because they keep pointing at labor being strong and thinking that that's where they can press and that that's where they have room to tighten that and the housing market. So uh, it's, it's really hard to say, but my gut feels like by this time next year, they will already be cutting rates. If I had to guess, purely a guess. So um, let's bring it back to real estate to wrap up. Um, I want to ask you a question, and, and this is, I know this is bouncing around a little bit, but it's, it's on my list. It's a question I don't want to end this podcast without asking, which is how do you look at demographics and, you know, Elon Musk has been way, way out there talking about um, you know, the uh, I guess the descent of population into negative territory for maybe a lack of a better term. Um, how do you view demographics as it relates to residential real estate to housing? 
you know, over, that uh, is... over, over the long term. I mean, that's not a, you know, 12 month problem or a 24 month problem, but, but longer term. So that's an interesting question. I've been thinking about demographics a lot. I haven't, I haven't applied what I think about demographics specifically to housing, but I could probably, I could riff on it a little bit here. I, I think that it, it's probably similar to what I think is, is going to happen with the labor market itself. And the, the thing that's going on with U.S. demographics, for those listening and they're wondering what the heck we're talking about. So the U.S. population is getting older. We're living longer. We're having fewer children. And as a result, that is having downward pressure on total labor availability right? We, we've seen the labor participation rate, which I will show on my screen here. Let me share my screen. So we've been seeing at the bottom, we have the labor force participation rate. At the top, we have unemployment colored by consumer sentiment. So down here at the labor force participation rate, which is the percentage of people old enough to be working that should be working uh, and, and are working, that percentage has been falling since the year 2000 pretty sharply. And it fell really hard when COVID began and has, has tried to recover, but has not really fully recovered. And this is part of the reason people feel like we have a tight labor market when we have so many job openings, but it's clear that there's less people participating than were participating in the past. That leads economists and central bankers to believe that if they just push their fingers on the scale enough, those people will come back to work or they have room to tighten and there will be enough labor to fill those jobs. There's, there's some disconnects here though in what's actually going on with the demographics. And it's related to this chart. So this chart is showing a lot of data and what it is, it's the population divided by age groups up here there every five years is a different color. This black line is their participation in labor. It's the amount, percentage of them that actually work jobs. And these values here is the population itself. And that's been changing since the year 2000 to 2020. What we've seen since then is an explosion in older people, right? This is 70 plus, this is 65 plus. It started from a very low percentage here in the year 2000, and it's been rising. The number of people 70 plus started from about 20 million. Now it's 40 million. And each of these older cohorts from like 50, plus, 50 to 55, 55 to 60, 60 to 65, you can see all of these groups, the amount of people in them is growing from 2000 to now. Now, my, my data ends, I believe, in 2021. So what this is showing is that our boomer generation, which was the largest generation in U.S. history, is now at retirement age. They've been at retirement age since 2010, which was 65 years after World War II, and they have been retiring. And that group of people doesn't participate in the labor market. They also don't buy houses as much as younger people, right? They're not developing families. They have their wealth. They have their homes. If they're buying homes, it's because they're moving or because they're investing, not because they need one for their families. So I think to answer, to bring it back to your question of what do I think is going on with demographics? How do I think it can affect labor? Well, I think it's affecting employment in the sense that we have more and more people who are considered able to work but because of their age, because of their propensity to want to retire, they simply are not going to return to the labor force. Some of them may because costs are rising and their fixed income budgets are getting squeezed and perhaps they must go back to work to get some money. But only 25% of the 70 plus population even holds a job. And if you look at these other groups here, over the next like 10 to 15 years, we could have another 50 to 60 million people joining this group over here, joining this group of 70 plus Americans who only work about 25% of the time, and many of them already own a home. So what I think is possibly facing US, the US economy is a total recalibration of what we consider employment rates to be, what we consider full labor deployment to be, and how many people may want to buy a new home? I mean, just, just based on historical trends, right? Because if you think about the 70s and even the 80s, we had a strong real estate market. 
that was because of that growing boomer generation. They were at prime working age. They were in their 30s to 40s. They were buying homes. They were experiencing wealth. And those people now have the majority of the wealth. So I, I really, I think that there's, we're, we're headed into a serious transformational phase. We're in one now. Uh, and some of the stuff that happened with COVID accelerated some of that transition. It forced some people, or at least it encouraged some people to retire early who maybe weren't ready to. And that accelerated some of the exodus out of the labor market. Uh, but I, I, I really believe that over the next few years, we're going to face this stark reality. And economic growth generally will be hampered by these demographics and then it will be incumbent upon innovations to step in and fill that productivity gap, which is something Jeff Booth talks about a lot. If you've read his book, um, The Price of Tomorrow, he talks a lot about how, in, how innovation is very deflationary and it helps society to expand. And that will become a much more prescient need over the next few years as these demographics really develop. Fantastic analysis. I think I've used just about every last minute that I can uh, that I can I can get with you, um, TX. I got to tell you, I love your articulation. I love uh, the charts and the depth of thought that you put into these macro uh, considerations. Uh, I'm very grateful that you took the time to come on the channel. I just want to say a sincere thank you to that. Um, and again, for all of our viewers, if if you don't follow TXMC, you need to. Uh, Twitter handle is at TXMC Trades. Uh, he posts stuff daily, uh, some awesome charts, and gives little bombs of wisdom throughout the day. Um, his YouTube channel, Alpha Beta Soup, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, he goes through the same types of charts and 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 articulates really well, kind of what his thoughts are about them and how they might affect the economy in different different sectors that are very relevant to investing. And uh, as always, listen, we really appreciate you guys watching this channel. Uh, if you're not subscribed, I'd love it if you just take a moment, hit that subscribe button, hit that bell so you get notifications uh, when I post new content. And uh, TX, man, I hope I can convince you to come on again in the near future. Like I, I just think you add so much value and uh, you and I jive so well together. I would love to, uh, to spend more time with you both, both on podcast and off podcast because I just love learning from you. Well, I really appreciate you having me on here. I learn a lot from you as well. It helps add a lot of color to the numbers that I'm looking at. You have a lot of experience that I don't. So uh, I find that really beneficial, both for, hopefully for your audience, but also for me. Uh, and I'm yeah, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Guys, thanks for watching the Savant Report podcast, and we'll see you again next time.